This is a regular keyboard, but it's really boring. Now this, this is a mechanical keyboard. I use it when I want to enjoy the sound of every key press, but other times I just want peace and quiet. So I need a keyboard that's completely silent. There are so many types of switches out there, but they all make some noise. Even if it's faint, it's still there. You might think maybe a touchscreen keyboard is the answer, but touch screens are not silent either. When you tap the screen, you still hear a sound. It's a soft one, but if you really focus, you will hear it. Also, tapping on glass hurts my fingertips. So if even touching makes a sound, how on earth do we make a keyboard that's truly silent? How do we press a key? Like this. If we don't touch anything, we won't make any sound. But how can we press a key without touching anything? To achieve this, we're gonna use lasers. Yeah, the same lasers we used to play with when we were kids. And sometimes, even as adults. So how are we gonna use the lasers? Exactly like in those museum and bank heist movies, where the whole place is crisscrossed with laser beams. And if the thief touches one of them, the alarms go off and the cops show up. We don't want sirens, nor police. What we want is, when we touch a laser beam, a key press get registered. Beside being silent, the keyboard also needs a few extra features. First of all, it needs to connect via Bluetooth, because I want to use it even when I am far from the laptop. It also needs to give feedback. On a regular keyboard, you know you have pressed a key from the sound and feel. Even touch keyboards show you what key you are pressing on the screen. So I will use a small display to show the key that's being pressed. And lastly, most importantly, there has to be a caps lock indicator. The worst feeling ever is typing your password perfectly, only to realize it's wrong, because the caps lock was on and you didn't notice. Sure, I could solve this by just removing the caps lock key altogether, but some people love it and actually use it, so I decided to keep it and add a clear indicator to show on its own. Before we get deeper into the tech behind the keyboard we are building, we need to understand how a regular keyboard, like this one, works. In a keyboard, every key sends an electric signal when it's pressed. A microcontroller inside that keyboard reads that signal, figures out which key was pressed, and sends that information to the computer. A first thought might be that there is a connection for every single key, directly connected to the processor. Theoretically, sure, but in practice, this gets messy really fast. This keyboard has about 90 keys. If we had a separate connection for each key, that means we would need 90 connections. Not only that, the controller would need to have 90 separate inputs to read all different signals. That is super impractical. So to understand the smarter solution keyboards use, let's imagine we have 100 keys, numbered from 0 to 99, and we lay them out in a grid, 10 rows by 10 columns. We also number the rows and columns from 1 to 10. Now we can pinpoint any key by its row and column. For example, key number 42 would be in the 5th row and 3rd column. With this setup, we only need 20 wires total, 10 for rows and 10 for columns, instead of 100. And that is how real keyboards work. The keys are arranged in rows and columns. When a key is pressed, we detect which row and column get activated, and that tells us exactly which key was pressed. If we want to do the same thing here, this keyboard would need 22 signals, 6 for rows and 16 for columns. But that's not how it's done in reality. Keyboards do something clever to reduce the number of signals even further. In most cases, the number of required signals can be reduced to the number of rows. So for a keyboard like this, we would only need 6 signals in total. How is that possible? Let's look at a smaller example. A keyboard with 3 rows and 5 columns. Here's what happens. When a key is pressed, it connects the column it's in with the row it's in. So, if we apply a voltage, usually 3 to 5 volts, to that column, the signal will travel through the key and show up on the row, and the processor will detect the signal. This means if we see voltage on row 2 for example, we know some key in that row was pressed. But how do we figure out which key from that row? Well, we don't apply voltage to all the columns at once. Instead, we scan them, one at a time, column by column. In this case, we won't measure any signal while scanning columns 1 and 2. And when we get to column 3, we will measure high voltage on row 2. Then we know the key in the third column and second row was pressed. This scanning technique also handles multiple key presses at once, even from the same row or column. Now, even though this method cuts down the number of signals we need to read, it does mean we have to actively switch the voltage from column to column. But that's not hard to manage, and can be done using a demultiplexer. As for our laser keyboard, we will do way better than that, and we will reduce the number of signals to one, but that's a topic for later. Now as we understand the basic concept of how regular keyboards work, it's time to figure out how we will build our laser-based keyboard. We will need laser generators and laser sensors. The core idea is that we will use lasers to form a grid. At the end of each laser line, we will place a sensor that detects whether the laser beam is reaching it. This way we create a laser matrix. And with the sensors, we can tell when something interrupts one or more of the beams. 
and that something will be a finger pressing a key. Unlike regular keyboards, we can't simply connect a row and a column to detect which key is pressed. And that brings a few challenges. When we press a key in the laser matrix, we get a signal from the row and column of that key. And by matching the intersecting row and column, we know which key was pressed. So far so good. The problem appears when two or more keys are pressed at the same time. Let's imagine we press two keys that are on two different rows and two different columns. Now we have signals on two rows and two columns. And their intersection gives us four keys instead of two. That's one of the limitations of this design. But if we assume that we want to press more than two keys at the same time, and that there will be a slight delay between key presses. We can solve this issue with software. Lasers usually operate at 3 to 5 volts. Their brightness increases with higher voltages. But since we are likely to use around 3 to 4 volts, I tested the sensors to make sure they can reliably detect the lasers, even at lower voltages. And they do. But there is something you have to know if you want to use these sensors. A lot of sellers on websites like Amazon and AliExpress have the wrong specs listed. They say the sensor outputs high voltage when it detects laser and zero when it doesn't. But when I tested it, it was the opposite. A lot of people left bad reviews on these sensors, saying they don't work, but chances are, they just didn't realize the output is reversed. Let's get back to our project. To design the keyboard, we need to have a clear idea about a few things, like its size. We need to know the length and the width, and also how many rows and columns we are going to use. The number of rows and columns depends on the key layout we want. To design the keyboard layout, I used one of the many available websites. Now most keyboards have angled columns to fit finger reach, but to make our design simpler, we are going to place the keys in a regular grid. I will remove the keys I don't use and combine a few others together. And this is the final layout I'll be using. So the keyboard will have 5 rows and 12 columns, which means I will need 17 laser modules and 17 sensors. Another important thing we need to figure out is, what is the optimal distance between laser lines? Because this distance doesn't just determine the overall size of the keyboard, it also defines how big each key is going to be. First, I measured the size of keys from several keyboards, and also I measured the distance between each key. The distance from the start of one key to the next is about 2 cm. To find the best spacing, I started with a simple test setup. I designed parts to hold the lasers, and parts to hold the sensors, plus some adjustable paces that let me change the distance between laser beams with the precision. But while I was doing the test, I ran into a problem. The laser beam wasn't aiming correctly, and it wasn't hitting the sensor. At first, I thought the issue was due to the 3D printed parts. Maybe they deformed during or after printing. So I designed the parts to be bigger hoping that would reduce any bending. I also switched the printing material from ABS to PLA, since PLA prints more easily. Even with the new parts, I still had problems getting the laser to aim correctly. That's when I started suspecting that the problem wasn't with the printed parts, but with the laser module itself. To make sure the problem wasn't with the 3D printing, I tried a different approach. I took a wooden board and drilled holes in it perfectly vertically. This should make all lasers parallel and perpendicular to the board, but in practice, the laser beams still weren't parallel. So where is the issue coming from? Well, the problem is this. The laser beam isn't coming out straight, and it's missing the sensor target. This problem can happen for two reasons. First, the laser module itself is poorly manufactured, meaning the beam isn't aligned with the cylinder of the module. In this case, if we rotate the module in place, the laser beam will draw a circle around the target. The second reason? The issue is with how the module is mounted. Maybe the printed holder isn't straight, or maybe the hole was drilled at an angle. In this case, if we rotate the module, the beam stays in the same place. What I saw in my tests looked more like the first case. When I rotated the laser module, the beam moved in a circular path. Sure, the holes I drilled weren't perfect, but it was clear that the beam was shifting in a circle when I turned the module. So I had to come up with a solution to this problem, because this keyboard won't work unless I can line up the laser beams perfectly to hit the sensors. The first thing I thought was, since the laser beam could be pointing anywhere around the target, I would need to adjust it along two axes. One is the horizontal axis, to move the beam above or below the target. The second is the vertical axis, to finely tune the laser so it hits the sensor exactly. Designing a mechanism that can do this in a small space would be tricky. But luckily, after thinking about this for a bit, I realized I only need to control one axis. But before we get into how, more than 90% of the people watching the videos aren't subscribed to the channel. So if you like this kind of content, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss the upcoming videos. And you can check out the older ones, like the skydiving robot video, or the one where I built a screen using LED strips. And if you are into this kind of stuff, you can also join our Discord, where you can chat directly with me and with others who are into these projects. Back to the keyboard. So yeah, even though the laser beam could technically point in any direction around the target, 
As we mentioned earlier, if we rotate the laser module in place, the beam forms a circle around the target. That means I only need to control the horizontal axis. First, I rotate the laser until it's either directly to the right or to the left of the sensor. Then I adjust the horizontal position until the beam hits the target perfectly. The idea I'm using is really simple. I'll use a flexible part that acts like spring. I'll mount the laser on top of that and then use a screw to fine tune the laser's direction. I tried a few different designs for this part. The version I chose is simpler than a spring. It's a small piece shaped like the letter Z that bends when I push down on the top. To make sure all the laser beams are properly aligned, I designed this piece. I mount the holder here, then adjust the laser so that all beams line up perfectly. As for the laser modules, we don't really need the circuit board they come with. We only need the actual laser generator. So I bought laser modules without the circuits. But when it came to the sensors, I couldn't find them without the circuit board. In general, this circuit is quite large, and most of the components on it aren't really necessary. Like the LED light and its resistor. So instead, I will only use the sensor itself and design a costume circuit. That includes only the essential parts. To design the circuit, we need to understand how the sensor actually works. The sensor is basically a phototransistor, or in other words, a light-sensitive transistor. Here we can see that it has three pins. The first pin connects to 5 volts, and the last one goes to the ground, 0 volts. The middle pin is the sensor's output. We can imagine the sensor as a switch between the output pin and the ground. When the laser hits the sensor, the transistor activates. The switch closes, and the output signal becomes 0 volts. When there is no laser light, the switch is open, and the output voltage is undefined or floating. But in general, output voltages should always be well defined. So we connect the output pin to 5 volts using a resistor, called a pull-up resistor. This resistor usually has a high value, around 10 kilo ohms. That's why when there is no laser, the output signal is pulled up to 5 volts. And when there is a laser, the switch gets closed, and the output is connected to the 0 volts. And now we understand why the sensor behaves like this. So in the circuit we are going to build, all we need is to place a pull-up resistor between each sensor's output and the 5 volt line. On the original sensor board, we can see a capacitor between the 5 volts and the ground. The purpose of this is to stabilize the power supply and to reduce noise. In our custom circuit, we don't need a separate capacitor for each sensor. Just one large capacitor connected across the power supply to serve all of them will be enough. This way, we simplify the circuit a lot. Before we design the complete circuit, we need to go back to the list of requirements. The main requirement is that it works over Bluetooth. So for that, I'll use a Bluetooth module called HC06. To test the circuit, I made a prototype keyboard using small buttons, an Arduino, and connected them to the laptop via Bluetooth with the HC06 module. So how do we get the laptop to treat this circuit like a keyboard? Bluetooth devices communicate using something like a language, called a profile. There are many different profiles, depending on the device type. For keyboards and mice, the profile used is HID, or Human Interface Device Profile. This profile allows the device to simulate input commands, like key presses or mouse movements. But the HC06 module uses a much simpler profile called SPP, Serial Port Profile. This profile only allows sending plain messages. That means this module can't directly simulate key presses, like an actual Bluetooth keyboard. What we will do instead is, when I press a key, a Bluetooth message is sent, containing a word representing the key. On the laptop, a Python script will receive that message and simulate the corresponding key press. The key can be a letter, number, or anything else, like space or enter. We can even simulate multiple key presses in sequence, like typing a full sentence. Or combinations like Ctrl A, Ctrl C, and Ctrl V. That solves the first requirement. As for the second one, for the feedback, I will use this small screen to show the pressed keys. I first tested writing something simple, and even though it's small and basic, it's really nice. We can even draw on it or show simple animations. I combined these parts into a small 3x3 laser keyboard. The electronics included an Arduino, the Bluetooth module, the screen, 6 laser emitters, and 6 sensors. This keyboard, as we mentioned, follows the matrix method. 3 sensors for the rows, 3 for the columns. On the computer, I wrote a Python script to receive Bluetooth messages and simulate key presses. In the first test, there was a problem. When I pressed a key, the code thought the key was being pressed fast until I lifted my finger. That's because the Arduino was sending the same key message every 50 milliseconds, and the Python code simulated the press for each message. There are many ways to fix this. The method I used was to store the keys received in the previous message, and only trigger a press if the current key wasn't in the last message, meaning it's a new key. That way, a key press is only triggered once, unless I lift my finger and press again. Now one last thing. Remember we said, a matrix keyboard 
only needs as many input signals as rows and we say that we will do much better and use a single line. Now let's see how. We will do something similar to regular keyboards. As we mentioned, they scan columns one at a time with high voltage. This can be done in many ways, one of which is using a component called demultiplexer. This component has multiple outputs and can shift the signal between them. We choose which output is active. It can also work in reverse, becoming a multiplexer, where it has many inputs and we select which one to read. What we will do, we will connect each sensor to one of the multiplexer's inputs. Then we will scan these inputs rapidly in order. That way we can read all sensors sequentially using a single Arduino input. In reality we will need to, because the multiplexer only has 16 inputs, while the keyboard has 17 sensors, so I will connect the last sensor directly to the Arduino. With this I was ready to design the final keyboard circuit. I first designed the two layer PCB shaped like the keyboard, with spots for the 17 lasers and 17 sensors, with their resistors. At the top section of the PCB I left space for the Arduino, the multiplexer, the Bluetooth module, the screen and a small space for the batteries. When I tried ordering this PCB I found out that it costs more than $75 because of its large size. But on sites like PCBWay smaller boards are much cheaper. Any board under 10 by 10 cm costs $5 for 10 pieces. So I redesigned the board trying to fit all parts into a 10 by 10 cm space. There wasn't enough room but since I'd be ordering 10 pieces anyway I reused different sections of the board in multiple ways in the new design. I ordered the BCPs, one week later they arrived. Now it's time to get to work. First I made sure all boards worked and began soldering the components. Arduino, multiplexer, resistors. And added sockets for the sensors, so I could adjust their position more easily than if they were directly soldered. After finishing the boards, it was time to prep the keyboard's frame. I set up the base and tested the laser holders. Once I confirmed everything was ready, I mounted the electronics and connected everything. The sensors were a bit too long, so I trimmed them to better fit the keyboard. Since there were many components and wires, I double checked everything before powering up to avoid any wrong connections. After mounting the sensors, it was time to install and align the lasers. This part takes time, but the good thing is I only need to do it once. Each laser needs to be aligned precisely with its matching sensor. Once done, the core part of the keyboard was ready and I could begin testing. First I confirmed that the screen was working. Then I checked the most important part, the caps lock indicator light. Then I uploaded the Arduino code to test the keyboard. The screen was showing key presses but not always correctly. It was clear that the Arduino was reading the first row as constantly pressed. So I updated the code to show exactly which rows and keys were active. Turns out multiple rows were showing as always pressed because some sensors were slightly misaligned. After adjusting the sensors and properly aligning the lasers, everything started working correctly. I printed the paper with the keys to help visualize the layout and confirm the keyboard was functioning correctly. And now I can connect the keyboard to the laptop and start typing. Even though I'm fast on regular keyboards, typing on this one was really slow at first, probably because the electronics were exposed and I was afraid to accidentally move the wires while typing. So it was time to finish up the keyboard cover all the wires and screw it all together. And just like that, the keyboard was ready. It's not the most practical keyboard in the world, but typing with it is really satisfying. It works on batteries or can be powered using a USB-C phone charger. And if you want to make the keyboard yourself, you will find all details in the description and the Discord server, including the circuit design and the 3D models. One last thing, I have extra PCBs that I want to give away to the viewers. If you have any suggestions how I should do that, please write in the comments. Since you've made it to the end of the video, I will assume you enjoyed it, so please leave a like and subscribe, and check out the other videos. Also let me know in the comments if you have any ideas for other projects you would like me to do.
See you in the next one. Bonus info. The next project will have a bit of magic in it.